As a big fan of Windows handhelds, I am very excited to take a look at one of the most powerful devices on the market today. This is the iNeo 2, and it looks amazing. As many of you guys will know, I rated the original iNeo as one of my favorite devices of last year. After turning this into a Steam Deck, my semi-customized iNeo 2021 became my most used Windows handheld. Shortly after that device released, I created the Next, which was a bigger handheld with a bunch of new features, but the performance did not improve that much over the original iNeo. They recently released the iNeo Airline, which is currently the best small form factor Windows handheld, but it also has about the same performance as the older iNeo devices. This new device is an entirely different beast and it is the first real improvement in an iNeo device since the initial iNeo from the beginning of 2021. Diving right in, I think one of the most striking aspects of this device is the screen. And even while I'm filming this video, it still looks fake to me because of how good it looks. This on its own could be a big enough change for an updated model, but they have thankfully updated something a bit more important. We'll go over more specs in the future, but I do want to list some of the more notable ones to set the stage. The iNeo 2 comes with the new Ryzen 7 6800U processor. This is a top-of-the-line AMD processor with a Zen 3 Plus CPU and an RDNA 2 GPU. The GPU is what makes this the most capable gaming handheld thus far, and we are going to see how it holds up later in this video. Aside from that, we've got a beefy 50 watt hour battery and a new 1200p IPS screen. In the interest of full transparency, I do have to state that this is a prototype unit that is on loan, and some of it is under an embargo that I'm obviously going to follow. This essentially means that there are some aspects of it that I'm not able to film or talk about, but I will say that they are things that reflect that this is a prototype and not a retail unit. In its current state, this prototype is probably 90-95% to complete. Anything that I'm not able to talk about or film in this video will be shown off on a retail unit down the line, so make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. When it comes to the controls, we've got two big analog sticks with an LED ring light around the edge. At least on this prototype, I don't think this light is as good as it is on the air. The air's light is much brighter, and I think the saturation is also a bit higher, but this might be something that improves in the future. These joysticks are Hall Sensor joysticks, which is one of the big buzzwords of 2022. This just means that they use magnets to determine input and have smaller dead zones as a result. I put a picture of the retro power version of this device up on the community tab, and some people said the buttons were too small. They probably do have space for a slightly bigger D-pad and ABXY buttons, but I wouldn't say that they're too small. The D-pad is one millimeter smaller than the one in the Steam Deck, and the ABXY buttons are 0.8 millimeters smaller, but the Steam Deck is a bigger handheld. The bigger difference is the fact that these are directly above or below the analog sticks, but Aya does have another product with some of what this has, with the main exception being that it has a slight Xbox control style going on. I don't know if that would have been possible on this model because the screen is under this faceplate and you wouldn't have that much room to go with if you wanted to go with that layout unless you made the device longer. The D-pad and ABXY buttons are CNC prototypes with some improvements that are still being made. The D-pad is the same style as the one in the retail Next units and I anticipate that it will feel identical to that when it is finished. Another thing that I want to point out is that this prototype uses the same analog rubber tops as the ones used in the next. I've already commented that these are easy to damage, but Aya told me that they're going to use a new formula for this part on the retail iNeo 2 units, so I wanted to say that I did ask since that was my main criticism of the next. Outside of that, the biggest difference is going to be in the area around the screen. Some people said the iNeo 2 has wasted space on both sides of the screen, but if you look at both of these devices and all things were equal, which would you choose? I would choose the top one every time because it looks like a cleaner product. So we do have a front glass piece on this, and if I tilt it like this, you can see that it goes across the entire thing. Now, I originally thought this wouldn't work that well, but it does. I think it looks amazing on this white shell. This one and the retro power model are probably the best colors for this because they don't reflect that much. On the all black one, I think this would end up reflecting the entire world, and it would be too distracting for me. Something like the PSP or Vita can also do this, but those are smaller handhelds with less surface area that can turn into a mirror. The only place where we do not have glass is where the controls are, and this was done largely just to hide the bezels. Since you already need glass on top of the screen, this entire front panel can just sit on top of the screen itself, just like the early iPhones. When you get to all of the edges, you have 2.5D glass to smooth the transition over to plastic material. In the short time that I've had with this device, I've enjoyed the new ergonomics. 
I don't think it's as comfortable as something like the Ioneo Air, which is a bit better to hold in the hands due to its size and grips, but this is easily better than the main line of devices from this company. You have this small edge here, and as you can see, this thing can go directly into the gap in my hand, and then I can access all of the controls easily. This 2.5D glass helps round out this edge, so it's not that rough. The Ioneo Next also has a grip, but it's nowhere close to being as good as the one that's in this new device. The layout and the grips make this a significantly more ergonomic handheld than my old favorite from this company. If we take a look at the profile, we can see that they have a decent grip on this. On the other side of this small panel, you would find one of the rumble motors. You have to take this panel off to access the screws if you wanted to upgrade the SSD or poke around inside, and this is the only place where you will find screws. There are no screws anywhere else on this device, including on the back. The top also doesn't have screws, but you can get a good look at our shoulder buttons and our two hotkey buttons. These were introduced on the air, and they perform a lot of actions that make this device easier to use. Outside of that, we have a big fan exhaust, two Type-C ports, and a fingerprint reader combo button. That's enough about the hardware and controls. Now I wanna move over to doing some performance tests and I wanna highlight some of the generational improvements that we can see going from the iNeo 2021 to the next and the new iNeo 2. If you've never seen me do this test before, I have all of these devices running this game at the minimum settings at 720p resolution. For every device except for this first one, you will be able to see the temperatures for the CPU and GPU. But essentially what we do is we just come out this door and we look at the performance stats while we stand in the static scene. So as you can see, our FPS is at 104 with 15 watt TDP, and we're using about 27 watts of total power to get this performance with the brightness set to max with Wi-Fi enabled. We've got that same scene again, but this time we're on the INEO next. We are also at 15 watt TDP, and we can see that our FPS is around 117. Our total power consumption is around 28 watts, so we're using about one watt more than the previous model, and our CPU is sitting at 57 Celsius with the GPU at 54 Celsius. Based on our readings, our CPU is almost asleep right now, but we are maxing out our GPU at this point, with the clock speed sitting at around 1.3 gigahertz. And now, we have the iNeo 2. Right off the bat, we're at 180 FPS, and we are also maxing out our GPU at this point, but we still have over 1 gigahertz of additional headroom to work with. Our CPU and GPU are about the same temperature as they are on the next, but our GPU is a bit higher. Our charge drain comes in at around 29 watts, so this is using a bit more power than the other two units, but this is probably due to driving a higher resolution screen. Let's do something interesting now. Let's find out what TDP we can use on this new device to equal the same 15 watt performance that we can get on the older AMD 5000 series chip. You might be surprised to find out, but we can go all the way down to 11 watts to get that same FPS. Our charge drain goes down to 23 watts with this setting, so we can save a bit of extra power playing this game, or any other game for that matter, compared to the older AMD handhelds. I also want to take a look at the minimum and maximum TDPs on this. The minimum TDP that I can set on the INEO 2 is 6 watts. This can go a bit lower than that, but I'm also going to set it to 6 watts just for an apples to apples comparison. You can see that we're sitting at around 32 FPS with a charge drain of around 15 watts. This game is going to dip lower than this in practice, but for this purpose we're just going to say that it is around 30 FPS on average. With our minimum setting of 6 watts on the INEO 2, we get 41 FPS. So this is a bit better than the next and our charge drain is also a bit lower for some reason. We are only using 13.7 watts on this. I think the biggest difference between these two devices is that the INEO 2 should be able to average well over 30 FPS a bit better in more demanding areas. The interesting thing to point out is that our CPU and our GPU are asleep right now with the GPU at 200 megahertz and our CPU at 400 megahertz. These are the lowest that these can go. Now that we have this data, it will be interesting to see how this compares to the Steam Deck in this same situation. So here's our Steam Deck, and you'll see that not only are our clocks not at the lowest level, they can fluctuate. We are using the same amount of power as we are on the other two devices, but the difference is that Valve's Black Magic allows the deck to run this game at 60 FPS with only 6 watt TDP. It also doesn't have any dips from this when you pan the camera around. So that's the low end, and obviously the Steam Deck is better in this case since it's using alien technology, but let's raise the graphics quality now to see how that changes things. Starting out first with the Steam Deck at its max of 15 watts, we are using 26 watts of power, and we are just under 60 FPS at 720p max settings. This isn't capped FPS, and it could go higher than this if it had the power. There are a couple of things that I want to point out while we're here. 
This is using the old fan curve, and as you can see, our CPU temperature is almost 90 Celsius. I can't feel any of that heat because of how far it is from my hands, but I do just want to point that out. On the iNeo 2, we are also at 15 watt TDP. On this device, we're at 64 FPS at 720p max settings, so we have less than a 10% improvement over the Steam Deck, but we still have the benefit. Our charge drain is a bit higher at 28 watts, so we are using a bit more power than the Steam Deck, but our CPU temps are significantly better given that they are 20 Celsius lower than they are on the Steam Deck. So that's one of the bigger improvements on this device since it has a bigger fan. 15 watt TDP is low for this chip, so let's try to push this a bit higher. At 32 watt TDP, we are at 83 FPS at 720p max settings, but our charge drain is up to 53 watts, so this battery would die in less than an hour in this extreme use case. But we have one other thing that we can take advantage of, and that is our higher resolution. At 1200p max graphical settings, this is how things look. The image quality gets a slight boost, namely in the fine details, but the battery life is going to take a bigger hit. I would use something like this, but only if I was going to play this device plugged into a wall. This is still the best performance that has ever been possible in a gaming handheld to this point. Now that we've covered all of that, let's take a look at a collection of games and emulators at different settings. First up, we have Far Cry New Dawn at 1920 by 1200 with the graphics settings set to high. I have the TDP set to 22 watts since it was enough to get this game to run at over 30 FPS with these settings. After seeing how well this ran at 1200p, I wanted to take a look at older games with maxed out settings using 22 watts. Here's a short clip of Fallout 4. And here's Borderlands 2 at 1200p max settings. You'll notice that even at 22 watt TDP, this is still running about 10 Celsius cooler than the Steam Deck does at 15 watt TDP. We also have great performance with Skyrim at 1200p max settings. If you're a mad lad, you can also play Overwatch 2 at 1200p with the graphics settings set to low at a decent FPS. For me, I would rather play this with a keyboard and mouse because it always feels like I'm throwing when I play this on PC with a controller against people that are using a mouse and keyboard, but to each their own. Our final full game at 22 watts is Dirt 3. Just like the previous games, this is at 1200p max settings. For our next game, we have Sekiro. I started this at 22 watts, but we had some dips with this set to 1200p with max graphical settings. I changed the TDP to 28 watts, and that was enough to improve things significantly. For our final game Don't in this mini showcase, something. we have Monster Hunter World. Look. I set the resolution to 1200p, and we have the graphics settings set to high. This game also required 28 watt TDP to play at an average of 30 FPS, but I can still remember this when handheld struggled to play this Most game at 720p low, so this is a big jump. You can carve materials off of monsters. These materials are vital for producing new equipment and upgrading. We also have a small collection of emulated games for this showcase. We will do more in a future video, but I wanted to give you guys an idea of what this handheld is capable of. First up, we have Switch emulation at native resolution. You'd have much lower battery life compared to official hardware, but this could easily handle most Switch games if you wanted.
Next up, we have Wii U. This processor shines when it comes to systems that aren't already handhelds. Here's some PS3 emulation. We are only at 22 watts, and this has a lot of headroom for more demanding PS3 games. That leaves us with Xbox 360, which also runs much better on this processor than it does on older AMD handhelds. Anyway, that's it for this first look video. If you have any questions, leave them down below. Happy gaming everyone, Taki out.